and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is the 16th of January 2018, a day after I recorded part 13, and <laughs> that seemed to be a bad number. <laughs> because, um, yeah, you know, in the end uh, I lost the hypercam, uh, I'd only recorded the picture that you see right now. Uh, the sound was changing, I don't know what else uh, was all going wrong there. So today I'm going to do the first video with this new OBS desktop camera. Still I have my uh, backup recording running in case something goes wrong. I don't want to lose the audio under no circumstances. But anyway, I'm going to play a video to you a little later, a little later on, so that um, uh, I need this OBS camera anyway, because with the Hypercam it doesn't record desktop sound. But without any further ado, and still my excuses for last time, uh, for the end of the reading, <clears throat> I didn't know that the camera was gone. So um, for the moment right now, I want to continue in the reading of the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, and we are going to enter some really interesting things. This is exactly the second part of what we read last time, that's, uh, this why that's why this is also called the First World War Part Two. And Matthias Erzberger. Who Matthias Erzberger is? Uh, well, th there we're going to see a little video from. I'm going to come to that later when I read that. Last time we were stuck here on the bottom of page 118, as you see where I made this little yellow highlight. This is where we have to continue our reading. But I'm just going to go for continuing continu continuity sakes one little paragraph back and I will read here at the scandal of his death. Now we are still talking about this Cardinal uh, Ferrata who um, was assassinated as I think. Huh? We have here the Cardinal uh, Domingo Ferrata in this picture. Granulated sugar can be useful. The inquest was stopped there. <laughs> So the author then continues, uh, let's put this away, um, the Abbe Daniel adds that the sudden departure a few days later of the servant of the deceased cardinal provoked quite a lot of remarks, especially as he had apparently been the servant of Monsignor von Gerlach before his master entered holy orders. This Germanic prelate, a notorious spy, so we can assume that he was a member of the Society of Jesus, because they are the spies of spies. A notorious spy was to flee from Rome in 1916. He was going to be arrested and charged with the sabotage of the Italian battleship Leonardo da Vinci, which blew up in the, day of, uh, in the Bay of Tarante, taking with it 21 officers and 221 seamen. His trial was resumed in 1919. Von Gerlach did not appear and was condemned to 20 years of hard labor. Well, if he really sent, uh, served that sentence, is of course not written here and not known. And as you remember from the case of uh, the priest of Uruf, who murdered the woman he had a relationship with, the 19-year-old girl that was pregnant with his baby, and he was sentenced to 22 years of hard labor, and he only served a few years and then retreated to a monastery. Oh, that's the way these people get uh, punished. I don't know if that's how von Gerlach did serve his sentence anyway. Through the case of this participati uh, participating Chamberlain, editor of the Osservatore Romano, we get a clear idea of the state of mind in the Vatican's high spheres. Now we speak here about the Osservatore Romano. Well, this is um, quite interesting. I have a picture, of course, in that here. That is a uh, well, why does he show me this? Uh, the Osservatore Romano is actually an official magazine. Here it is. This is the picture I was looking for. L'Osservatore Romano, here you can see that. Uh, an official Roman Catholic magazine or newspaper. 
And um, interesting that uh, the editor of the Osservatore Romano now gives us a clear idea of the state of mind in the Vatican's high spheres. Now, he continues here about uh, the Abbe Brugueret, and I put a picture in here of Abbe Brugueret, as you can see his work, L'Art de Mourir, The Art of Dying, which is this called, because I could not, for the love of God, find any picture of the Abbe Brugueret on the internet, and I was really looking hard a few times already, I can't find one. Anyway, <clears throat> the author says, it is again the Abbe Brugueret who describes the entourage of the Holy See, quote, professors or ecclesiastic, uh, ecclesiastics. They are not put off by any obstacles in their pursuit of impressing on the Italian clergy and the Catholic world in Rome respect and, and, and admiration for the Germanic, Germanic army, contempt and hatred for France, unquote. Now, Ferrata, who we've just seen in the picture a little bit before, who favored neutrality, had died just at the right time. How convenient, eh? And Cardinal Gaspari became Secretary of State. In perfect agreement with Benedict XV, he did his best to serve the interests of the central empires. Now, without taking anything in, advantage, uh, in, in advance that I want to tell you later on, that you will see in the video that I'm going to play, Cardinal Gaspari later on became Pope Pius XI. And you will see how all these three antichrists have been working together all the time. Benedict the Fifteenth, his successor Pius the Tenth, uh, Pius the Eleventh, and of course Pius the Twelfth. Yeah. Hitler's Pope. We're going to see about that during the reading here. It's quote-unquote kind of strange how you see the history of these people. So this Cardinal Gaspari, who became Secretary of State, later became Pope Pius XI, in perfect agreement with Benedict XV. Quote, considering all this, it is not surprising then that Pope Benedict XV in the following months worked hard to maintain Italy on the path of intervention, which would best serve the Jesuits, friends of the Habsburgs. You probably remember the picture of the Habsburgs I put in last time in this video, and that the Habsburgs are the ruling family of Austria and Austria-Hungary at that time. Uh, just remind you on that fact, and that, of course, Pope Benedict worked hard to maintain Italy on the path of intervention which would best serve the Jesuits, the Jesuits who are the friends of the Habsburgs. So that means that the emperor of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire will probably rule With the consent, not only of uh, not only with the consent of the Jesuits, but will actually practice Jesuit politics. Yeah. Otherwise, he was not friends of the Habsburgs. Uh, they were not friends of the Habsburgs. Now, at the same time, the author continues, the moral of the Allies was cunningly undermined. On the 10th of January 1915, a decree signed by Cardinal Gaspari, Secretary of State to Benedict XV ordered that a day of prayer should be observed to hasten peace. One of the compulsory exercises of piety was the reciting of a prayer written by Benedict XV himself. The French government ordered that the pontifical document should be seized. This prayer for peace was considered to be a softening and destructive manifestation capable of slackening the efforts of our armies at the time when the German hordes were feeling the irresistible pressure which would push them out of our territory, and when the Kaiser could see coming the terrible punishment his unpardonable crimes deserved. The Pope, it was said, wanted peace, come what may, at a time when it could only be in favor of the central empires. The Pope does not like France. The Pope is German. Monsieur Charles Ledre, another Catholic writer, confirms, quote, On two occasions, mentioned in some famous articles of La Revue de Paris, 
The Holy See, by inviting Italy and later the United States to keep out of the war, did not merely wish for a quicker end of the conflict. According to the Abbe Brugret, it served the interests of our enemies and worked against us. Unquote. But the actions of the Jesuits, therefore the actions of the Vatican, huh? the author is very clearly here putting the actions of the Jesuits as the actions of the Vatican. They are the same. The Jesuits work for the advantage of the church, not against it. What the church says, the Jesuits say, and the other way around. The actions of the Jesuits, therefore the actions of the Vatican, were not only felt in Italy and the United States. Any means, every place is good enough for them. It is not surprising, then, to see pontifical diplomacy busy from the start at hindering our food supply, dissuading the neutrals from joining our side, in order to break the bond holding the Entente together. The Entente are the allies of the First World War. Nothing was considered too insignificant if it could help this great task and bring about peace by provoking some weakness amongst the allies. Quote, there was worse, solicitations for a separate peace. Between the 2nd and the 10th of January 1916, some German Catholics went to Belgium to preach. In the name of the Pope, they said, a separate peace. Yeah? Between the 2nd and 10th of January, some German Catholics went to Belgium to preach in the name of the Pope, they said, a separate peace. Why do Germans go to Belgium? Because Belgium is one of the high countries of the Jesuits. I could not tell you a country that is more infested with Jesuits than Belgium. And that's probably why they went there. But the Belgian bishops accused them of lying, but the nuncio and the Pope remained silent. Then the Holy See thought of bringing together France and Austria, so hoping to make France sign a separate peace or demand that, with her allies, they should negotiate a general peace. A few weeks later, on the 31st of March 1917, Prince Sixth of Bourbon gave the famous letter of the Emperor Charles to the President of the Republic. Quote, as the maneuver had failed on this side of the Alps, it was bound to be tried again elsewhere, in England, in America, and especially in Italy. Break up the temporal forces of the Entente in order to stop its offensive attacks, ruin its moral prestige with a view to weaken its courage and bring it to terms. These two things make up the politics of Benedict XV and the, all the efforts of his impartially always have been and are still aimed at hamstringing us. Unquote. This was written by a notorious Catholic, Monsieur Louis Canet, and this is what the Abbé Brugueret wrote. Quote, we only learned four years later, through the declarations of Matthias Erzberger, published in the Germania on the 22nd of April 1921, that the proposal of peace proclaimed by the Pope in August 1917 had been preceded by a secret accord between the Holy See and Germany. Now, this is a very important little part of this book reading, and I will go into this a little later, but first I will finish the whole chapter here, and then I will go back into what we've just read here and tell you who Matthias Erzberger was, and uh, we're going to read a little bit about him. But for the moment, I will just go and uh, continue the book reading here, but hold fast to what I've just told you, that Brugret wrote here, quote, we only learned four years later, so after 1917, that is 1921, of Matthias Erzberger published in Germania on the 22nd of April 1921, when the war already was three years over, that the proposal of peace proclaimed by the Pope in August 1917 had been preceded by a secret accord between the Holy See and Germany. 
Very important to keep that in mind. Another interesting point here, Edmond Paris continues, is that the ecclesiastical diplomat who negotiated this quote-unquote secret accord was the nuncio in Munich, Monsignor Eugenio Pecelli, the future Pius XII. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get you a picture of Pope Pius XII. If I can type the way I'd like to. Antichrist Pope Pius XII. This is one of the pictures that we see from him, of him during the Second World War. He doesn't see anything, he doesn't say anything. It quite speaks for him. Eugenio Bacelli, when he was still the Secretary of State for the Vatican, he signed the Concordat with Germany on the 20th of July 1933 during the reign of Pope Pius XI, his predecessor. And here he is again, and here he is again in the Cedia carried away. And uh, here is his coronation of uh, Pius XII. And uh, there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of pictures that I have from Pope Pius XII. This is one of the pictures that we can keep here for the moment during the reading. An interesting point, says the author, is that the ecclesiastical diplomat who negotiated the secret court was the nuncio in Munich, Monsignor Eugenio Pacelli, future Pius XII. He was nuncio in Munich, oh, in, in Munich and Berlin, in Germany, means the highest representative of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany between 1917 and 1929. Huh? Just an interesting note for you to <laughs> to know. Huh? Yeah, an interesting point that is. One of his apologists, the RP Jesuit Fernesol, wrote, quote, on the 28th of May in 1917, Monsignor Eugenio Pacelli presented his letters of appointment to the King of Bavaria. He tried hard to enlist the cooperation of William II and the Chancellor Bethmann Holweg. On the 29th of June, Monsignor Pacelli was solemnly received by the Emperor William II at the headquarters of Kreuznach. So the future Pope, Eugenio Pacelli, was starting his 12 years as nuncio in Munich, then in Berlin, in the way he meant to go on, for during those years he multiplied the intrigues to overthrow the German Republic established after the First World War and prepare the revenge of 1939 by bringing Hitler to power. Okay? This is what Eugenio Pacelli did. He was working for that, bringing Hitler to power almost 20 years before it happened. It is all planned. In politics, nothing ever happens without being planned. And this was planned by the Jesuits long time ago. The future Pope was starting his 12 years as nuncio in Munich between 1917 and 1929. Then he went over to Berlin in the way he meant to go on, for during those years he multiplied the intrigues, the conspiracies, to overthrow the German Republic established after the First World War and prepare the revenge of 1939 by bringing Hitler to power. Or the revenge of 1933 by bringing Hitler to power, who then in 1939 was fighting the revenge of the Jesuits. The Second World War was not only a crusade, a spiritual war, but the Second World War was most and for all payback for the enemies of the Jesuits. And Pope Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli, who you see here in this picture, is a puppet of the Jesuits, was a puppet of the Jesuits from the beginning. I'm not sure if he was a Jesuit himself, that doesn't matter. He works for their agenda, so he is at least a coadjutor or whatever, and he is the Pope. He is the Antichrist anyway. Antichrist always is a bad person, huh? So, 
he had all these years that he worked in Germany to bring down the German Republic, you know, this Weimar Republic, this joke state they established in Germany after the end of World War I in 1918, until in 1933, Hitler came to power with the help of the Zentrum Party. And I'm going to mention that right now, the Center Party or the Zentrum Party, because you will hear that in the coming video that I'm going to play to you in a few minutes anyway. And then you know how to connect the dots. Yet, the author continues, when the Allies signed the Treaty of Versailles in July 1919, they were so conscious of the part played by the Vatican in the conflict that it was carefully kept away from the conference table. And, even more surprising, it was the most Catholic state, Italy, which had insisted on its exclusion. The exclusion of the Vatican. Through Article, 5, Article 15 of the Pact of London, and there I will also go with, with this video, which defined Italy's, uh, the Act of London from the 26th of April 1915, a secret treaty, which defined Italy's participation in the war, Baron Sonino had obtained the promise from the other allies that they would oppose any intervention of the papacy in the peace arrangements. This measure was wise but insufficient. Instead of applying the sanctions against the Holy See, which it deserved for sparking off the First World War, the victors did nothing to prevent the further intrigues of the Jesuits and the Vatican. These, eventually 20 years later, led to a catastrophe even worse, maybe the worst the world has known. Speaking about World War II. And now it gets interesting. Now you will hear something that I recorded years ago on talk show with Walt Stickel at that time. Jesuits derooting the Reformation. I took a little note from that. Because what the author says here, let, let's just go back that we understand it well. Edmond Paris says here, instead of applying the sanctions against the Holy See, which it deserved for sparking off the First World War, the victors did nothing to prevent the further intrigues of the Jesuits and the Vatican, and these intrigues, these conspiracies, eventually, 20 years later, led to a catastrophe even worse, maybe the worst the world has known up to now. Second World War. Now, what is my comment here? Um, I'm going to try to see if I can easily uh, put this link into a um, into a search because I don't know if this is still available this w in this website. I looked that up years ago, and uh, ah, yeah, it is here. Ferdinand Foch, Foch, Foch is the name that we pronounce it here, is maybe someone that you have never, ever even heard of. But Marshal Ferdinand Jean-Marie Foch was French, a French general and Marshal of France. He was also Marshal of Great Britain and Poland, a military theorist and the supreme Allied commander during the First World War. He was on the head of the Entente. Here you see his picture. Take a good look at it. An aggressive, even reckless commander at the first Marne, Flanders and Artois campaigns of 1914 through 16, Foch became the Allied commander in chief in 1918 and successfully coordinated the French, British, American and Italian efforts into a coherent whole, deftly handling his strategic reserves. Now, I don't go much into Marshal Fogg. You can do your own research. I tell you that this Marshal Fogg was not only Jesuit trained, but his brother was a high Jesuit priest. I'm just scrolling down the Wikipedia article a little bit. Now, why is this so important? Why am I telling you about Marshal Fogg anyway? Why doesn't Edmund Paris speak about that? I don't know. I can tell you the following. Marshal Foch did a quote in 1919 when he was the supreme allied commander of the allies called the Entente in World War I. 
This Marshall Fox said, quote, this, and referring to the quote-unquote peace treaty of Versailles, which ended the First World War, yeah, here, the Treaty of Versailles, um, this is not peace. This is an armistice for 20 years. Huh? <laughs> That's what he said there. Okay? Um, also, he said, and this is what we can read here on Wikipedia, and by the way, I got this uh, from this Wikipedia page too, Fock considered the Treaty of Versailles to be a capitulation, a treason, because he believed that only permanent occupation of the Rhineland would grant France sufficient security against a rival of German aggression. As the treaty was being signed, Fock said, this is not peace. It is an armistice for 20 years. So here you see what I just copied out of it and told you here in this document you can read here online with me on Wikipedia itself. Yeah? And I know Wikipedia is not a very reliable source, so don't comment me uh, on, on, on that in the description box of the, uh, in, in the comment section of the video. Yeah, but that's Wikipedia. You know, you can find that here, but you can also, of course, look up where is the um, source from that. Because that is Ruth Hennig, Versailles and After, 1919 through 1933, a book from 1995 on page 52. Then do your own research, get the book and read that afterwards, if you don't believe me reading this to you from Wikipedia. I didn't know this from Wikipedia in the first place. I came this across some video or so that I read some years ago or some other document that I read some years ago. And then I found it back here on Wikipedia. I don't care where it comes from as long as it is the truth. Yeah? And so we have to understand with in correlation what we read here in the book of um, Edmond Paris. Edmond Paris says, instead of applying the sanctions against the Holy See, which it deserved for sparking of the First World War, the victors, meaning the Entente, the Allies, did nothing to prevent the further intrigues of the Jesuits and the Vatican, meaning this joke in Versailles, this peace treaty in Versailles they pulled off. These, ev uh, 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 these eventual 20 years later led to a catastrophe even worse, maybe the worst the world has known. That is World War II. And therefore, even the commander, the highest officer in the military of the Allied forces in First World War, makes a statement where he says this, the peace treaty of Versailles, is not peace. This is an armistice for 20 years. He said that in 1919, and when broke World War II, when did, when did World War II break out? Exactly 20 years later, 1939. Yeah? Do you see now how important this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, is and how important it is to connect the dots with other books? Well, what other books? Well, for example, the book Behind the Dictators that I read on my channel too. I have the PDF open right here in Chapter 12, which is um, called, and we can see that on that video that I'm going to show to you in a moment, that video, uh, that uh, chapter 12 of the book Behind the Dictators is called Pro-Germanism of Pope Pius XII, as you can see right here. And I'm going to play this video from, minute, uh, tw from 21 minutes 50 on for a little 20 minutes for you, because there is very valuable information. Very valuable information concerning Matthias Erzberger. Now, Going back to the secret history of the Jesuits, we spoke about here in this little paragraph about Erzberger. Listen closely. Quote, we only learned, said Abbe Brugeret, four years later in 1921 through the declarations of Matthias Erzberger published in Germania of the 22nd of April 1921 that the proposal of peace proclaimed by the Pope in August 1917, had been preceded by a secret accord between the Holy See and Germany. Now, why is this so important? You have to understand that it, during the time of World War I, before, during and short after, the Holy See, the papacy, 
the Vatican has lost, had lost its temporal power. It lost its temporal power in 1866. The 1260 years that I spoke of in, uh, during the reading of, um, uh, what was that, that Martin, that Martin Luther book that I read, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, I told you that Martin Luther nailed it when he said that the first pope actually was Boniface III uh, in 606. And I'm going to show this to you. This is the video that I made on this. It's right here on my channel. Emperor Focus, Pope Boniface the Third, and the 1260-day year prophecy. Yeah? Here you can learn that the 1260 days, the 30, uh, three and a half years, the 42 months of the reign of the Antichrist, predicted by Daniel and predicted by uh, other prophets in the Bible, is not exactly or does not only have to run between 538 and 1798 as the SDA teaches, but when you understand that Pope Gregory, who was the predecessor of Pope Boniface III, actually wasn't the Pope, but was just the, um, the Bishop of Rome, and he warned and said, if there comes a Bishop and calls himself the Universal Bishop, you know, Vicarius Filidei and the Universal Bishop, which is the title of uh, Pontifex Maximus today, then he will be a pre, uh, then he will be the Antichrist. That's what uh, Pope Gregory said. He will be the Antichrist or a predecessor of Antichrist. And Pope Gregory died, and Pope Boniface took over because he was given the power by Emperor Phocas. Yeah from uh, Constantinople, where he was ruling. He killed his predecessor, Emperor Mauritius, and his family, came to power and gave the Bishop of Rome, Boniface III, then just Bishop, not Pope, the spiritual power over the Western and over the Eastern Church, the bridge builder. If you want to learn any more of that, go to the playlist of... Um, what is this, uh, uh, of, of the Martin Luther book reading uh, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. Go to that playlist and you will find the, the fourth or the, or the fifth part, Emperor Phocas, Pope Boniface and the 1260 day year prophecy. Watch that, get that book for yourself, read it for yourself. Now, the point that I wanted to make actually is the following. We read here, that the proposal of peace proclaimed by the Pope in August 1917 had been preceded by a secret accord between the Holy See and Germany. What is the reason of this secret accord? This is what you're going to learn during my book reading of Behind the Dictators in this chapter 12, where I show you the video from right now in a, uh, within a few moments. And you will understand what that secret treaty was. And you will understand why the Vatican did it this way, because at that time the Vatican did not have temporal power. He was taking away his temporal power. That was the fulfillment of Revelation 13. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. That was the deadly wound, the taking away of the temporal power of the Pope between 1866 and 1929. What happened in 1929? Well, the Lateran Treaty, when Mussolini with the Italian Republic gave the Vatican back its status as a state yeah? and the Pope the power to be the emperor of that church state, the Vatican. The woman, the Roman Catholic Church that writes the beast, the Vatican, fulfillment of all biblical prophecy. But in this time between 1870 or 1866 and 1929, the Pope did not have any temporal power. So therefore, the Germans went on a secret negotiations with the Pope, with the Holy See, to prepare a secret accord between the Holy See and Germany. And now we are going to learn the role of Matthias Erzberger in there, who he was. I'm going to look up a picture here for you. Um, 
just give me a second. I have a few pictures of Erzberger. Let's take this one. We can ha have a look at this one. This Matthias Erzberger, who he was and what he did. And by the way, he of course worked for the Antichrist, but he was very much disappointed and let a lot of secrets out in the open. He even wrote a book. And that book is, um, let me see if I can show you that. Uh, oh no, it's, it's, not, it's not in here. It is in Behind the Dictators. We can read of that book. Erlebnisse im Weltkrieg means uh, my uh, experiences of the World War of Reichsfinanzminister A.D. Matthias Erzberger. Uh, that means that he was the Minister of Finances. A.D. means out of service. Matthias Erzberger in his book of 1920. Yeah? In his book, he gave a lot of those secrets that we've just heard about away. And um, Edmond Paris is not going very deep into this in this book. This is why I say, okay, when I read Behind the Dictators, chapter 12, I, wrote, uh, I read about Matthias Erzberger. And what I read there, I will show you right now in this little about 20-minute um, video that we are going to, uh, to watch that. Let me just have a look because I took a note when uh, to stop the video. So we are starting at 21 minutes 50 and we are stopping at 41 minutes 22. So for about 20 minutes we're going to watch this video right now and you will learn about Erzberger. You will know about the secret treaty between Germany and the Holy See, the secret London treaty as it is called. And you will see how Erzberger, and this is the point why I'm making this, with this treaty, built the ground on which the uh, rebuilding of the Vatican's uh, refounded, let's call it that way, uh, temporal power was built. Because of Erzberger's work as propaganda minister and minister of finances and every other position that he held during before and after the First World War, 1929, the Lateran Treaty was only made possible. So, let's have a look at what I said here in Pro-Germanism of Pope Pius XII, the final chapter of the book Behind the Dictators from Herbert Leo uh, Lehmann. Leo Herbert Lehmann. And uh, let's see what Erzberger was all about. And you will get much more information than you actually would expect by just getting the book um, that we are reading right now, Secret History of the Jesuits. But it is combining these books. This is why I show you this. It is combining these books. It is combining the knowledge that you get from different books, real history books, that do not leave out the Jesuits, but that expose the Jesuits. Because when you go to school and you study any history, when you go to university and you study any history, when you go to church and they tell you about history or they tell you about church prophecy, they never ever teach you about the Jesuits. And this is what you can do when you do your own research. You connect the dots and all of a sudden you will see a clearer picture of history. So, listen to this video. Now we go into Matthias Erzberger. The story of Germany's collaboration with the Vatican in the last war has been told, as so often before, by a devout Roman Catholic who had himself been on the inside of the intrigue and who, intrigue or conspiracy, and who, vain by nature and bitter from disappointment, spoke out when he felt that he had been abandoned by his former associates. Our witness is none other than Matthias Erzberger, leading member of the Catholic Center Party, militant German imperialist in 1914, Germany's foreign propaganda chief until 1917, means during the war, when he promoted the Reichstag's famous peace resolution, imperial undersecretary of state, leader of the German armistice delegation, minister of finance and one of the fathers of the Weimar Republic. He was assassinated in 1929 at sorry, 1921, by young German nationalists a few months after the publication 
of his outspoken book, My Experiences in the World War. In German, Erlebnisse im, Ersten, äh, im Weltkrieg. Von Reichsfinanzminister A.D. Matthias Erzberger. Which means Minister of Finance in the Reich, out of service Matthias Erzberger. His book. Okay. My experiences in the world war. Probably interest, in, interesting to read also. Now, secret Vatican treaty with Germany. One of Erzberger's chief objectives, and don't forget we are still speaking about all the influence that Eugenio Pacelli, the later Pope Pius XII, Antichrist Pius XII, has had in that time. One of Erzberger's chief objectives was to secure diplomatic immunity and extraterritorial rights for the Holy See. Now we see everything that came up that led to the Lateran Treaty in 1929, so I want you to pay attention. As early as October 1914, a few weeks after his appointment as Chief of Foreign Propaganda, he suggested the establishment of a small neutral papal state in that part of Rome which lies on the left bank of the Tiber, with a corridor to the sea and port. His negotiations finally led to a draft treaty regarding the recognition of the temporal power of the Pope. You see where this is leading? This treaty, he says, had the approval of competent personalities of the German Foreign Office. The first version was submitted by Erzberger and his friends in Vatican circles in the beginning of 1915. It was formulated with characteristic thoroughness. The following extracts of this secret treaty are from Erzberger's book, pages 127 and following. And here we can actually read the preparation of what is known as the Lateran Treaty from 1929, as I already said. Oh, the Germans did according to the order of Pope Leo XIII to become the battle sword of the Church and even paved the way for the healing of the wound of Revelation 13 to the first the sea beast. Article 1 of this secret treaty, we read, quote, The temporal power of the Pope is recognized by the high contracting powers as extending over a territory including Vatican Hill and a strip of land connecting it with the Tiber and with the railroad to Viterbo and to be designated as Church State. Unquote. Article 2. The Church State is permanently independent and neutral. Its independence and neutrality are guaranteed by the high contracting powers. Article 3. Sovereign of the Church State to the Pope. During the vacancy of the Apostolic Chair, the sovereignty is exercised by the College of Cardinals. Article 4. Citizens of the Church State are Papal Legates, Nuncios and Internuncios, members of the papal court, officials of the administrations and palaces of the church state, members of the palace guards as well as ecclesiastics permanently residing in the church state. Article 5. The Kingdom of Italy pledges to render the Tiber navigable for ocean-going ships with draught of five meters along the border of the church state and thence to the sea within two years from ratification of the present treaty, which is a secret treaty, remind you. Further, in Article 5, Papal ships can at all times navigate on the Tiber to and from the sea without being subject to the authority of the Italian state. Should Italy be at war, or should it for other reasons deem necessary to close the Tiber waterway to general traffic, a channel is to be kept open for papal ships, and river pilots are to be placed at their disposal. Papal ships shall be treated by the high contracting powers as extraterritorial in peace and in war, and not subject to interference by a foreign power. BAM! 
Here you have a way how they implied the Vatican red lines after World War II because the papal see, the Holy See, the Vatican has had always access through the Tiber to the Mediterranean Sea. They could ship out anything, everything and everyone they ever wanted without ever being checked and controlled. Article 6. The Kingdom of Italy will pay to the Holy See within six months after the ratification of the present treaty the sum of 500 million lira to cover the cost of the papal court and of the administration of the church state. Well, this 500 million lira, I think it is in the book The Vatican Billions by Avril Manhattan, if I'm not mistaken, that you can learn what the Vatican actually used this 500 million lira for. And otherwise, because I don't remember all the little parts of it, you can contact Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, tom at cwaves.us, and ask him the question, because I know that he knows of this. He spoke about this in earlier readings. I don't know if it was in the Global Vatican, I don't know if it was in its absolute last work up to now, which is Roman Civil Liberty by A.J. Wiley, but he spoke of that before, because I spoke with him about that, but that was not on a broadcast, that was in private that we spoke about that. And he knows that, but I think also it is in the book The Vatican Billions by Avril Manhattan. 500 million, million lira to cover the cost of the paper court and of the administration of the church state. Now, Article 7 of the still secret London Treaty. The sovereignty of the church state includes finances and jurisdiction. That, my dear listeners, is the reason why the Vatican Bank is the biggest money laundering bank in the world. You can go there and launder your money. You only have to pay 15% to them and the rest is yours. But of course, that is not for quote-unquote lay people, but for governments, companies and of course all the papal knight orders. And of course whitewashing the money from the CIA. Drug trade and everything. The sovereignty of the church state includes finances and jurisdiction. Yeah? Interesting treaty, eh? Now, Article 8. Diplomatic representatives of foreign powers accredited to the Holy See enjoy within the territory of the Kingdom of Italy the same privileges and exemptions as diplomatic representatives of the same rank accredited to the Kingdom of Italy. In case of a state of war or a break in diplomatic relations between the power they represent and the Kingdom of Italy, they have to take residence in the church state. And for confirmation of this, go to Tom Fraser's reading, The Global Vatican. Francis Rooney, former American ambassador to the Holy See, admits and tells you stories about who was there during the Second World War and took residence in the church state of the Vatican. Very very interesting, because there all intelligence agencies run together, because they are, of course, all controlled by the Jesuit order, and there is no better informed intelligence agency in the world than the Vatican. Article 9. The high contracting powers after the ratification of the present treaty will invite all those powers which are not signatories to this of this treaty 
to recognize the temporal power of the Pope over the territories designated in Article 1, as well as the extraterritorial status of papal ships as provided in Article 5. Finally, Article 10. This treaty shall be ratified as soon as possible. Ratification documents will be deposited with the Holy See. The treaty enters into force on the day on which ratification documents have been deposited. Those were the ten first articles of the Secret Treaty of London of 1915 that you probably never ever heard about and paved the way for the Lateran Treaty of 1929 that gave back the temporal, the worldly, the civil power to the Pope. It is not astonishing that the liberal government of Italy should have resented this planned infringement of their country's sovereignty by Germany and the Vatican. Nor was this all. Germany has never given without receiving. Only indirectly does Herr Erzberger inform his readers of the assistance which Germany had received and was to receive from the Holy See. Now we are speaking about an international Catholic committee. After Italy entered the war on the side of the Allies, Erzberger, so we are talking about the First World War, right? After Italy entered the war on the side of the Allies, Erzberger, as the Kaiser's chief of propaganda, organized in collaboration with an emissary of the Papal Secretary of State, an international Catholic committee in which each country was represented by five or seven delegates. Its object was to urge upon all belligerents that the territorial independence and the political freedom of the Holy See should be guaranteed in future peace. This International Catholic Committee and several of its subcommittees met repeatedly in Switzerland and Holland. Its chief purpose was to explain the German viewpoint to the world. Erzberger tells us that the high official of the Roman Curia, with whom he negotiated in Switzerland, was in charge of the exchange of prisoners of war. He was Monsignor Eugenio Pacelli the present, in 1942, Pope Pius XII. Now we speak about a papal peace offensive, still dealing during the time of First World War. Negotiations between Erzberger and Pacelli continued throughout 1916. In June of that year, Erzberger was, quote, asked by the German Secretary of State to inform the Vatican that the German government was willing to accept the good services of the Pope in the matter of peace and would appreciate them." Unquote. He had once consulted with his friend the representative of the Papal Secretary of State in Switzerland, meaning Pacelli, who believed that the time had come for winning the peace. But after the Vatican peace move had produced its first results, it was checked by a parallel intervention of the German Foreign Office through Spain. The results which Berlin wished to obtain in 1916 were only of a diplomatic and psychological nature. Germany was in fact merely trying to disintegrate the home front of the Allies and to obtain a clear picture of the political situation in the Allied camp. The papal peace move thus suited the Kaiser's purpose. In 1917, after Eugenio Pacelli had been appointed nuncio in Munich, Willem II, the Kaiser of Germany, became more outspoken in his demands. According to Pope Pius XII's official biography by Case van Hoek, published in London 1939 by Burns, Oates and Washburn, limited publishers to the Holy See, the Kaiser told Monsignor Pacelli, quote, that the Pope should mobilize the Episcopate all over the world in a moral peace offensive and begin by using his special influence on Catholic states by promoting a separate peace between Italy and Austria." <clears throat> Jesuit propaganda among Protestants. Well, this could be 
<laughs> an hour long video of itself when we take into regard Vatican II between 1962 and 1965 but we won't do that here Jesuit propaganda among protestants Erzberger's propaganda mission ended shortly after Pacelli had taken up residence in Germany with laudable frankness, Erzberger tells us on page 7 of his book that he had been assisted by, quote, a number of Jesuit priests who rendered us extremely valuable services in enlightening foreign countries, unquote. Nor were these propaganda activities limited to the Catholic circles. It should be of interest to Protestants in America to discover that this prominent Roman Catholic politician working hand in glove with the highest dignitaries of the Pope, also organized what was known as, quote, weekly evangelical letters, unquote. These letters were edited by Dr. Deisman, professor of Protestant theology at the University of Berlin, and were addressed especially to American Protestants. Says Erzberger, quote, Professor Deisman was very skillful in drawing up his mailing lists. We adapted the contents of these, letter, of these letters deliberately to American interests. Professor Deisman had reason to be satisfied with the response. The Secretary General of the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America, representing 30 evangelical churches, uh, church organizations with 125,000 communities, maintained close relations with him. Unquote. This gentleman might not have done so had he known that these weekly evangelical letters were financed and, in the last instance, directed by propaganda chief Erzberger and his Jesuit assistants. Erzberger's assassination in 1921 had been planned for some time. The young fanatics who killed him were only the instruments of others who wished to eliminate this man who knew too much, who already had said too much, and who had been too closely connected with events in which the promoters of the present world war saw Germany's humiliation. The young fanatics who killed him were only the instruments of others. Well, look at the assassination of JFK, look at the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in your country, and then go into the conspiracy of the Jesuits by reading Charles Chiniqui's Fifty Years in the Church of Rome and understand that the Jesuit order through the Surat family was behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and that Booth was nothing else than a patsy like the two young fanatics who killed Erzberger in 1921. It's all the same. So, and so far the video and so far, the for you probably interesting background information on Matthias Erzberger from the book Behind the Dictators from Herbert Leo, Leo Herbert Lehman, written in 1942. And this in combination then with what we just read in Edmond Paris's book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. I think I could not make a better example of how important, first of all, your own research is, and second of all, how all of a sudden you will come to an understanding like you have never come before to connect the dots when you learn of real history. Listen, the point that I want to make actually is the following. We are never ever told in school history that all the wars have an underlying religious reason. It's always about politics, 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 like today. The Americans say we need a regime change over there or a regime change over there and they go into there and then they're going to do a revolution, you know, in Northern Africa and in, in, in all these countries and it's all political, political. Nobody ever speaks about the religious implications. 
But when you take the Bible and you understand the Bible and then you measure the Bible on the history that you see in the past, you see that all the wars have been instigated, not only by the Roman Catholic Church and from the 16th century on the Jesuit order as crusades and holy religious wars, but that everything actually uh, turns around religion. Again and again and again. The Bible is, in the eyes of the Jesuits, the word of God that they need to extirpate and to get out of it. So everything that they do in this world, the Jesuits and all their minions, all the Jesuit coadjutors, all the Jesuits who aren't priests but who are workers with the Jesuit order, knowingly or unknowingly, do everything to hide that fact from you that it is all about religion, that it is all about what we read in the Bible in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm just going to open that for you. Ephesians chapter 6 in the King James Bible. And there we read between the verses 10 and 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the Bible here is very specifically telling us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So that means that all the wrestles, all the wars here on this world against flesh and blood are just a distraction. A distraction from what it is really all about. Namely, a spiritual fight against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Satan and his quote-unquote angels that are transformed, his fallen angels that are also transformed into ministers of righteousness, as Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Wherefore, the King, Bible, King James Bible continues, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Therefore, we have to put on seven weapons, and if we have these seven weapons, we have the whole armor of God. What are these seven weapons? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18 tell us about these. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That is number one. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, that's number two. And your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that's number three. Above all, taking the shield of faith, number four, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, number five. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Number six, the Bible. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying is number seven. So, praying, the Bible, the word of God, salvation, Faith, the gospel of peace, righteousness, and truth are the seven weapons that we are to carry in this spiritual war. Do not get entangled and think that you fight against flesh and blood because for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in 
high places. That's what we are fighting against. That's why we shall take on the whole armor of God and not a carnal sword, a carnal gun, a carnal knife or whatever. When you do that, you have lost already. And with this, I'm going to leave you to your own thoughts until we will continue next time in the secret history of the Jesuits on the next part, section 5, chapter 2, the preparations for the Second World War. And here we are going to go into also something else. But that's for another time. Now we have finished the very interesting part on the preparations and the actions during, before, during and after the First World War, of which we learned that Marshal Fock, yeah, the supreme allied commander of the Entente, of the Allies of the First World War, said in 1919, this is an armistice for 20 years, not a peace treaty. I thank you for watching and listening, and until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, Welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine of the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From their own, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.